to another round of sibling rivalry. Today we're playing egg roulette. We're here with the duet kids. Let's see what happens. It's gonna be good. <laughs> this is how the game works. They're gonna be going back and forth, tapping on this container right here, and whoever decides to lift it up first, if they don't react fast enough, the other person can smash their hand on the egg. Ew. And if they do that, they lose. You guys ready? Oh yeah. I'm ready for this my whole life. So you can mark our birthdays in there if you want to. All right. You can mark your birthday. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Pastor Chris, Chris, for all you do by signing thank you. kitten calendars for the youth. Thank you. All right, we'll catch you guys next time. Enjoy the rest of the service.
carved it into two different strands and made full braids going down like that. Two braids. Two braids. What about just me. one? Just one, one just braid? One, full one? Like a motorcycle dude. Is that going to work? No, because it's just too bushy. It's way too bushy. <sighs> I can't. All right. I'm just going to let it be. Just let it be. Can you just... Okay. Yeah, just let it be. Is All that right, good? Right. All right. Thanks, yeah, man. Well, good evening, CY. Welcome to Sunday night. Um, in case you don't know me, my name is Hal Jones. Maybe you don't recognize me because of my long flowing beard. But hey, I'm one of the leaders at the Washingtonville campus, and uh, I work with high schoolers. And this year, I'm really excited to work with a really great group of sophomore students. So um, this is the third week in a series that we're calling Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. And Brian and Brad kicked it off over the last two weeks, and I think you're, you can... Um, begin to see that, that Jesus really provides some very challenging teachings. He really pushes us in how we're going to live out our faith. And some of these things are really hard. And so I'm going to take you to the third one tonight. But um, before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. But before we do that, let's pray. So Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity tonight. Thank you for all those gathered in the watch parties and, and in their homes and wherever they may be. And I pray for folks who are watching even tonight or a week or a month or a year from now, Father God, that you would use me, Father God, and that it wouldn't be my words, but your words. And Lord, I pray for fertile hearts, Father God, fertile soil that these, these words and these teachings will land in, Father God, and your Holy Spirit will do the work of transformation. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've talked to you guys before. Um, I grew up in the church. I mean, since I was in short pants in Sunday school, all the way through high school. Um, I was in youth group. I did um, mission trips. Um, even I had the opportunity to, to preach a few times in my, in my church where I grew up. And, I, I, you know, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was 14, 15 years old. But three years later, when I left home to go to college at 18, I left all of that behind. Um, and through my college years and graduate school and into my married life, I just, I really didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Then something happened. Something unexpected happened. Um, a book came into my life. Uh, this book here, called The Jesus Creed by Scott McKnight. This book um, was a gift from my mother on Christmas, probably 2005, 2006. Um, this book was given to my mother by my younger brother, who actually knew the author. He loved the book, he gave it to my mom, my mom loved the book. She sent it to me for a Christmas present, and I took it and put it on the shelf and didn't look at it for a year. You know, we were attending a small Presbyterian church right here in Washingtonville. And, you know, I served there as an elder. I worked with Sunday school. I worked with high school kids, worked with youth group, did vacation Bible school. But there just, something was missing. Something was not right. There was something in the way. I just, I just couldn't take the next step in my walk of faith. Then something else happened. I was uh, on the phone with my mom. I was driving home from work, and we would call each other during those, those commutes, and we would often talk about church because she loved church. She was very involved in her church, and, and Tanya and I were making our way in the church that we were in. You know, and I said, I said, Mom, you know, I'm really struggling because I just I can't do this thing right. I can't do Christianity perfect. And, and I had this bizarre idea that if I couldn't do it right, if I couldn't follow all the rules, make all the right decisions, then I shouldn't be doing it at all. I just shouldn't be doing it at all. And she said, you know, no one can. And that, that started to break something open in me. I, I don't know what it was, but I, I just, I didn't feel like anyone had ever said that to me before, that, that no one can do this right. No one can do it perfectly. I wish I could remember the motivation or the, or the moment in which I took this book back off the shelf. I was probably looking for something else, and I found the book. And for whatever reason, God only knows, my heart was moved. I decided to read it. And I'll tell you, I wasn't three or four pages into this book, and my world was shaken. I was breathless, and I started to cry because of what I read there. Have you ever had that experience where you're reading the Bible, you're reading scripture, you're reading some sort of a book that speaks about faith, 
and something just captures your imagination, something just touches your heart so powerfully. Well, that's what happened to me. So you're probably wondering what I read. So here's what I read. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. It's epic. And you're probably thinking, that's a nice scripture and all. Good sentiments, but what about that scripture brought you to tears? So a little more information here. This scripture is found in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's found in slightly different forms, but in all cases, there's a conversation between Jesus and a, and a person learned or known, known who knows the law, like a scribe or a Pharisee. We're going to stick with Mark chapter 12, verse 34. So I'd ask you to grab your Bible and follow along. So in all of these, all the scriptures, Jesus is teaching. And somebody, a scribe or a Pharisee, asked him a question. They're, they were always around, listening in. And the scribe in, this, in, the, in, the, Mark chapter, in the Mark scripture, the, the scribe says, Hey, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? What's the greatest commandment? What is the number one commandment? And you know that there's no answer to that question. God gave all ten commandments. They're all of equal value and, and standing. You break one. You've broken them all. It's a trick question. They're trying to trip up Jesus. But of course, Jesus is smarter than that. They ask him to give him one commandment. He gives him two. And what is his, what's his response? Look, if you're a rule follower, like these scribes and Pharisees are like me, maybe you're like me, a rule follower. You just want to know the answer. You want to know the rule. You want to know what you must do to get this right, to do it perfectly. But Jesus isn't going to give you a rule. He's going to give you this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, after the second sentence in that scripture, with all your strength, there'll be a footnote. And if you follow that footnote, it's going to take you to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And you will read there an ancient prayer, a prayer that, no, that Moses taught, a prayer that was so essential to pre the people of the Jewish faith that they would say this prayer every morning when they woke up, even before they got out of bed, and every night before they went back to sleep, twice a day at a minimum. This prayer was critical to spiritual formation, to how they saw God. And this prayer was called the Shema, and maybe you've heard of it. And Shema simply means here in Hebrew which is the first uh, word of the prayer. There's a lot more to the prayer than just love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But this was the critical part. And Jesus took that part that was so important to the Jews. And, and, and this guy, this scribe, this Pharisee, he knows this prayer. He knows it by heart. He's memorized it. He says it every day. And he's like, Jesus is saying the Shema back to me, right? Now, if you go to the last line, the love your neighbor as yourself, there'll be a footnote there too. And that footnote will take you to Leviticus 19, 18. And in that scripture, it's all about dealing with people in your life. And it actually says, you know, um, don't hold a grudge against your neighbor. Don't take revenge against the neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus, being Jesus, reaches into that scripture, pulls out one little part of it, and he tacks it on to the first two part sentences of the Shema, and he calls it the greatest commandment. Jesus can do that. Don't mess around with scripture like that. But if you're Jesus, you can do that, right? And Scott McKnight calls this the Jesus Creed, the creed for living the life that Christ calls us into. That's just a name for it. It's just a fancy name. It doesn't really matter what you call it. But it's just an epic response because it takes all the rules out of it. It takes all of that away. And for me, a rule follower, right? I mean, as a kid, I followed the rules. At home, there were rules. At church, there were rules. At school, there were rules. In Boy Scouts, there were rules. Games, sports, rules. You follow the rules, things go well for you. You get outside the rules, things don't go so well. But what I found out as I grew and matured in my teenage years is that you can't possibly follow all the rules. 
And when I went away to college, I let the rules go. You know, even though Tanya and I found our way back to church, um, and we're very involved, and we loved our church, we loved the people in the church, um, I still knew, I felt there was something missing. And this Shema passage, this Jesus Creed, this scripture that I shared with you, it set me free of all of that. And I found my way back into a relationship with Jesus. And I'm going to kind of walk you through that. So number one, it's not about following impossible rules. It's about loving God. It's about knowing who he is, right? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it's about loving him with everything we have and everything we are. He is the... He is the foundation. He is the source of love. And in that, we can love him back. The second part, to love our neighbors. Look, if we get the, the vertical part right, if we get the God part right, then we get the horizontal part right. He gives us the power, the strength, the encouragement, and the wherewithal to love the people in our lives. So that's the first two parts. Now, later on in that interaction between Jesus and the scribe, um, he, Jesus actually says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two, the first and the second, the God, love God and the love neighbor. Everything in the Torah, all the rules, all the laws, the Ten Commandments, they all hang like a hook on loving God and loving neighbor. Without loving God and loving neighbor, they all fall away. They're meaningless, they're useless. But in loving God and loving neighbor, then they become possible because obedience grows out of love. And if we love God enough, we'll follow his rules because of our love for him. So it doesn't become about following the rules. It becomes about following Jesus. And in that, we stay in our lane, right? And the last thing is, in the Mark chapter as well, at the very end, Jesus and the scribe are having this conversation, and Jesus sees that the scribe gets it. He understands. And Jesus says to him, you are not far from the kingdom. I mean, imagine Jesus saying, Dude, young lady, you've got it. And you are so close to what it means to be a real follower of Jesus and a, and a member of his kingdom. Because you get this idea. All right. Now, this phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, this phrase is found all right, in the three Gospels. Paul picks it up in Galatians chapter 5, and in Romans chapter 9, and James, the brother of Jesus, has it in chapter 2 of his letter. So it's all over the Bible, and this whole idea of loving the other, right? But love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so here we are. Why do I say I wish Jesus never said that? I mean, it's been foundational to my walk with him, and it's my understanding of what he's asking. But why would I say I wish he never said it? All right, so... Stay with me, right? How is it that the marker of my ability to love others is measured by my ability to love myself? I mean, why would God set it up that way? If I can't love myself, then basically how am I going to love anyone else? And I'll tell you something. In my life, loving myself has been very difficult. So the logical outcome, right? If I don't love myself, how can I love my neighbor? And I'm not talking about love in the culture, love in our world, love on social media, love, you know, in, 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 in society or in our culture. I'm talking about God's love. So the love of the world is narcissistic, self-involved, self-focused, internalized. God's love is none of those things. We're talking the opposite of that. So why is it so hard? And why is it that I feel that I can't love myself enough to learn how to love my neighbor? Well, you see, I know what goes on in my head. And I know what's in my heart, right? I know the, 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 the depravity of my thoughts. I know the wickedness of my desires. And I know where they lead. I know that those desires lead to sin. And my life is riddled with guilt and shame and loss and pain. And then I go to places to get relief from that. So I look at myself and I see brokenness and unworthiness. And I have a hard time loving myself. Maybe, maybe there's chapters in the story of your life that are like that. 
then maybe the, the love and acceptance that you need and you crave, you didn't find it at home. Or you didn't find it in your friend circle, or you didn't find it in your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your relationships that you had. You didn't find it on the sports team. You didn't find it in clubs. You, you, you had to go search for it. And out of brokenness, you tried to cobble together some self-worth. And that failed, because that's not going to do it. You can't, you can't put together love of self. You can only receive love of self from God. So where, where do we go from here? Why would God set things up this way? Why would it be such a struggle? Well, there's two steps. I'm going to give you two steps. The first step is simply the gospel. The first step is we need to understand the source of that love. And we read it in 1 John 4.10. God loved us in this way, that he gave his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God loved us first. God is love. Once we understand the source of the love and that Jesus, in loving us so much, willingly went to the cross, took the wrath and the punishment for our sin upon his body, and he took it to the grave out of his love for us. And in that victory, in his resurrection, he claimed that all sin and all pain and all loss will someday be wiped away. And he reaches out to you and to me, and he calls us into the love that only he can give us, right? That's where the love starts. That's where our ability to love others starts. So maybe for you, this is outside your your lane. Maybe this is something you've never really heard. Maybe sitting there, either alone or with family or, or in a, at a watch party, you're like hearing this. You're like really hearing this. Like it's landing in your heart for the first time. Maybe Jesus has been calling you. Maybe he's been chasing you. Maybe you never have truly accepted his love for you and truly, truly um, internalized the fact that he walked to that cross and was nailed there and died for you and for me, for our sin. He was perfect and sinless. But he took it for us. And he buys us our freedom from all the guilt and all the shame and all the pain and all the sense of unworthiness. He bought that. He ransomed us. And he called you redeemed. Now God knows who you are right to the quick. He knows the pain, the brokenness, the loss, the sin, the heartache. But he sees you through the spilled blood of his son Jesus. He sees you as redeemed. He sees you as made new, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17 Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. You're clean, you're washed clean. You're redeemed because of what he did. If you've never given your life away to Jesus, if you've never said yes to him, this could be the day for you. This could be the invitation you accept to step into a real, true, abundant life. Please, Talk to somebody tonight. Make a phone call. Reach out to one of the CY leaders. Reach out to somebody who will join you. We would love to walk with you in this journey and take those next steps with you. Please don't let this opportunity pass you by. All right, so step two. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. We need to see ourselves as loved, as beloved. He calls us his, his sons and daughters, co-heirs with Christ, part of the kingdom. That's how he sees us. And he sees us through the redemptive work of Jesus. He sees us as redeemed. True love of self is accepting who we are as redeemed, made new, sons and daughters of the king. God's redeemed people. You see, if we can love ourselves and see ourselves as worthy, not because we've built some construct out of all the stuff that we've been through, but because outside, God's love, external, comes internal. We seek all that we need, not from inside of ourselves, because we're broken people, but from outside. And we accept that. We accept that because we are God's beloved. What follows is then we see the people in our lives, our spouses, our sisters, our brothers, our friends, our teachers, all the people in our, in our, in our sphere, in our world, in our relationships, 
we see them in the same way. We see them as redeemed. We see them as God's beloved. If we can see it in ourselves, then we can begin to see it in others. And that's how we can love our neighbor as ourselves. The gospel is a message of freedom. It's freedom from efforts to love what is broken. It's freedom to seek worthiness and, 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 and everything that we need outside of what we can drum up in ourselves. And the only source, the only true source of that is God. And the, and the thing is, if we are truly loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, then we're able to love ourselves because we are loving the King and He is loving us. And see, these two commandments, they follow from each other. You can't do the second without the first. But if you can do the first, if you can love God with all you have, then the second will flow from that. So the first step is to, is to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Look, it's a journey, and sometimes it's really hard. It's a tough journey. I know it from experience. I'm still on that journey. Won't you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this opportunity, for this time, and for all those who are watching tonight, wherever they are, whenever they are. Lord, I pray for renewal of hearts and minds, for transformation, I pray that these words, not my words, but your words, will penetrate and begin to work change. I thank you, Lord, for your love, for your unstoppable love, Father God, that makes us new. I thank you for your son, Jesus, and for the work of the cross and the power and miracle of the resurrection and how he calls us all to him. I pray, Lord, um, for the renewal and revival in the only name, the name, the matchless name of Jesus Christ. We ask all this in his mighty name. Amen.